फिर नेक्स्ट करते हैं ना ओके साउंड्स गुड ओ वी हैव समन फ्रॉम न्यूयॉर्क इज वेल All right welcome everyone welcome to a very special webinar uh, today we have with us uh, gautam bad who joins us uh, from west coast gautam welcome welcome to the broadcast uh, how are you doing all good sakit thank you for having me great so a quick introduction you know i mean gautam doesn't need introduction but for those of you who don't know him uh he is the managing partner and fund manager at stellar wealth partners india fund it's a partnership modeled after the original buffett partnership fee structure in fact gautam has been uh, lucky enough to write to buffett and get a feedback from him and on how to structure this partnership as he goes forward uh he is also the founder of stellar wealth partners private limited it's a sebi registered research analyst firm and a small case manager for investors in the indian stock market He is the author of the international best seller on value investing the joys of compounding previously he served as a portfolio manager at summit global investments uh, a sec registered investment advisor based in salt lake uh, city in usa his views and opinions have been published on various forums in print digital and social media and in 2018 and 19 he was profiled in morning stars learn from the master series so uh, gautam uh, today you are going to take us through a presentation titled the discipline of investing so uh, do let us know what exactly do you have in store for us and we can jump right into it sure so in my view the life of a value investor in encompasses something much more than business fundamentals and stock picking i think it's more a holistic view of life in general and uh, along with the investing portion which is very important it's also important to follow the right principles of life in order to have a very fulfilling and meaningful life so those are some of the elements which i'll bring along in my presentation today great so uh, i am going to just uh, put your presentation up let me know if you can see the screen i can see the screen uh, should i begin the presentation now sakit yeah please please do all right so welcome everyone today i'll be talking about the discipline of investing i've given a uh, part major parts of this presentation at multiple forums in the past but the good thing about this presentation is that the case studies keep getting updated because what i want to bring out through this presentation is that the principles of in intelligent investing are timeless and that is why the same patterns keep repeating again and again in the stock market once you gain sufficient amount of experience then you just have to recognize the patterns and implement the principles that's what the discipline of investing is all about but before we begin just a standard disclaimer that this presentation is only for information and knowledge sharing purposes and stellar wealth partners private limited is a sebi registered research analyst firm and we may hold some of the discussed stocks from this presentation in our proprietary accounts or small case model portfolios it's also possible that we may have exited or may exit from the stocks in future without prior notification so please do your own research and due diligence for any investment actions and consult a registered financial advisor for the same and the views expressed are my own and do not represent the views of any entity or organization apart from stellar wealth partners this is a statutory disclosure as per the sebi regulations for research, research analysts the most important one being the first one uh, the research analyst or the research entity and associates in this case do have financial interest in some of the stocks which we'll be discussing in the presentation today so this will be the frame uh, structure of today's presentation i'll take you through my investing framework with the help of case studies from the indian stock market and i'll conclude with my view on how value investing resembles a life discipline so all the great investors in the world have got one common attribute they all have a clearly defined investment philosophy if you look at any successful investor from the past you'll see that all of them adopted a investment philosophy which suited their personal nature which suited them as individuals so an investment philosophy is something that is built over time and it is very personal so there are multiple roadways to heaven in the stock market so as long as you practice intelligent investing any style of investing will work but just be consistent and stick to it and evolve over time so the investment philosophy is shaped by vicarious learning 
personal experiences books in my case these are the books that have defined my uh, investment philosophy over the years terry smith's investing for growth taught me how to invest in high quality businesses for the long term capital returns edited by edward chancellor taught me how to invest in cyclical businesses utilizing the capital cycle theory and joel greenblatt's you can be a stock market genius taught me how to invest in various special situations like demergers reverse mergers open offers delistings promoter management change etc we'll discuss those in the presentation today so this is a brief snapshot of my investment process flow at any point of time i have an active watch list of ideas that i'm evaluating and to that watch list new ideas get added from time to time through a very structured idea gener idea generation process and i finally come to an final active watch list of 10 to 15 high potential opportunities that in turn feeds into my portfolio construction and portfolio tracking and rebalancing process so let's talk about those two pieces first uh, the portfolio on an average comprises of 20 to 30 stocks the reason for this broad range of 20 to 30 is that during a bull market when you get broad based earnings growth across sectors you'll notice that most investors portfolios are more diversified because there are more opportunities to choose from but as the economy slows down or as we enter a bear market and as earnings growth dries up then investors portfolio tend to become more concentrated because there are lesser number of opportunities the aim is to generate 20 to 25% cagr for the portfolio over a minimum holding period of 3 plus years at any point of time and i follow a sector and market cap agnostic investing approach with a bias towards under researched and well run small to mid cap companies there is no hard cap to the contribution to the portfolio from any one single stock or sector or market cap range but the prudence is always maintained at all times for value investors risk management is first and foremost and value investors first focus on return of capital then return on capital and these principles are often reinforced during bear markets because that is when business model durability quality of management quality of business margin of safety diversification all these virtues are best realized and appreciated during a bear market so prudence should always be maintained at all times rather, rather than having to course correct during a future bear market the weight per stock ranges from 3 to 5% in the beginning and the exceptional opportunities may get an allocation of even up to 10% the decision to sell any stock is solely based on the business performance or the potential incremental rate of return from the current price and a portion of the portfolio is kept in cash if the valuations of the existing holdings and the watch list become exorbitantly high for portfolio tracking i track the industry trends of my portfolio companies like changes in the competitive landscape so a good example here is observe what is happening in the competitive landscape of the indian diagnostic industry or the indian paints industry competition acts as friction for value creation and you know if you get a very strong large uh, player entering your industry the stock market is very fast to derate the sector leaders uh, very expensive valuations so that is what we are witnessing in the diagnostic and paints industry in india today so it just helps to uh, keep a track of what's happening as far as the competitive landscape is concerned and whether the competitor's in entry is indeed credible or just a non event also be on the lookout for technology changes government regulations supply chain disruptions so as an example so just a hypothetical example so you have to understand parts of the individual company supply chain so a lot of Uh, Indian company, pharma company, still source a lot of the raw materials from China. Imagine a situation like what's happening in Russia, U U Ukraine today, where Russia has had so many economic sanctions from across the world imposed on it. What if China engages in a similar military action tomorrow? And if China also faces economic sanctions and China just shuts itself off from the rest of the world, what will happen to those pharma companies which have got a high dependence for the raw materials from China? So it's very important to at least be aware. at all times about the supply chain linkages of your individual companies because in the future while others are trying to figure out what to do in case of a geopolitical crisis you would have already done the work beforehand then you will be in a position to much faster take action i evaluate the quarterly results of each uh, company against my own expectation and the performance is benchmarked against that of competitors very important to see if the company is growing faster than competition because that signifies that the company is gaining market share that's the most simplest test of market share uh, capture i also carry out a detailed diligence in case any investment's performance is not as per the initial investment hypothesis so let's assume a situation where you have a rising stock market for one year but the stock which you have purchased is has actually gone down 
So it's very unusual for a stock price to go down over a period of a year in a rising market. So in those cases, do a deeper dive to see if something has actually materially changed, which you are missing. Finally, we come to the portfolio rebalancing piece. Some of the uh, triggers for a sale decision include absurdly high valuations, capital gross capital misallocation, a big corporate governance issue, or you simply found a better opportunity to invest. The portfolio companies are periodically ranked based on valuations, earnings performance, expected future returns from the current price, and the rebalances are done accordingly. Now, what happens in a when you're a fund manager or portfolio manager is that when you have a constructed a portfolio, then at any point of time, two or th- you know, out of suppose 20, 25 stocks, four or five stocks in a particular year, in a particular year, will probably be stagnant. Five to ten companies may give decent returns, while other five to ten companies may give very high returns. That is how a normal portfolio behaves almost all of the time over a long duration of time. So many times what will happen is these, these high quality businesses, they'll capture a large part of the future growth in their current valuations, and then they undergo time correction. The key is not to exit those high quality businesses immediately that time, but to be patient with them, let the fundamentals backfill, let the earnings growth catch up, be patient with them. If they've just captured a year or two of uh, future earnings growth, but if a stock has captured more than the next decade of earnings growth already into its current price, then that is the time to re-evaluate and possibly exit. But as long as the valuations don't become absolutely expensive, be patient with your high quality companies because there are very limited based on my experience of the last 15 years, what I've seen is that the number of truly high quality companies is very limited in each geography stock market, be it US or India. So once you have found the golden goose that lays the golden eggs, don't kill the goose, just stick with it. Finally, a fresh or fall on investment in an idea is done only if it can deliver an attractive uh, rate of return over a period of the next few years. The reason for this is you have to be more demanding for a new idea to come inside your portfolio because you would have already spent so much time and effort getting to know your existing portfolio companies. So for a new stock to enter your portfolio, it has to be materially better than the stock that you plan to sell. And and it's very important to always keep opportunity costs in mind, not just in terms of relative return potential, but also in terms of the superior business quality. So a new idea has to be materially better than the stock which you plan to sell from your portfolio. Now we come to the crux of today's presentation. That is how do I go about generating new ideas? So what, what does my daily schedule look like as an investor in, in the Indian stock market? So this slide encapsulates all the various sources and every single day I diligently review all of the corporate announcements on the Bombay Stock Exchange website. And for many people, it's a tedious exercise, but for me, it is like an intellectual treasure hunt wherein I may strike gold anytime. I review press releases, investor presentations, m and deal, joint venture partnership agreements. Here I would like to point out that, you know, because of automation and the use of technology, you are actually, you also have subscription tools like R30 newsletter in India, regulation 30 newsletter, which actually summarizes uh, all these uh, items on a daily basis in exchange for a nominal annual subscription fee. So I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I'm just trying to emphasize that if you lack time, there are enough technology tools tools available which can help you automate the information gathering process. You just need to uh, do some research and find out about them. When I'm evaluating quarterly results, I'm on the lookout for what I call breakout earnings. So what are breakout earnings? It refers to situations where the earnings uh, per share is, has gone up by more than 100 to 200% year on year in a particular quarter. And the revenues have grown by more than 50 to 100% year on year. And in such cases, if the management commentary is also very bullish, the stock market is slightly slow to adjust the stock price to the right higher level immediately. So even if you buy such stocks 5-10% higher the next day after earnings, you still end up making good returns. And in the stock market, this phenomenon is known as PEAD, Post Earnings Announcement Drift. As go through conference calls of the companies I'm tracking on Trendline, Alpha Street, Research Bytes, for certain micro caps even, company's website investor relations section is a good source. One of the peculiar problems with many Indian managements is that they tend to be overly bullish and give rosy guidance during the good times. So it's very important to corroborate and cross-check what they're saying and what their global peers are saying. So I also look, uh, check, if possible, what the global peers' commentary and outlook is. I review management interviews on print and digital media, 
For screening tools, I like to use Tejori Finance, very good tool for getting commodity chemical prices and conducting a reverse discounted cash flow operation. Screener.in is a very popular screen tool in India. And in that, I look for companies which have either completed a very big capex or are, are, or are on the verge of completing a very big capex in the next uh, few months. I also screen for stock price action. So I look for stocks setting a 52 week high, an all time high, or a post IPO new high. What do I ref mean by post IPO new high? So many times after the initial listing dip off, you'll see that stock prices go into a long term time consolidation range for eight, 10 months or more. And when the stock price breaks out, the, out of the trading range after that period of eight, 10 months, it generally coincides with something important taking place in that company or industry. So that's a good starting point for research. And here also, please note that time frame and context together matter the most when you're evaluating price action. So during a bull market, when you have hundreds and thousands of stocks hitting uh, 52 week highs every day, look for stocks which are hitting a multi-year high. In a, in a range bound or a sideways market, look for stocks breaking out to a fresh 52 week high. And immediately after a bear market crash, look for stocks hitting a three month or a six month high. These are good starting points for, for uh, research because if a stock is exhibiting relative strength in a bear market, generally that is one of the best areas to look for the next set of sector leaders and future stock market winners. So we saw what happened uh, in India in the last uh, few months after while the market was making lower lows and uh, market was as a small cap mid cap so continuously falling a select group of auto and auto ancillary stocks started breaking out to multi-year highs and 52 week highs so that clearly told you that something fundamentally was changing for the better in the sector a similar phenomena took place in early 2020 immediately after the covid crash when you saw many of those uh, pharmaceutical and api companies starting to hit multi-year highs and 52 week highs the stock market and stock prices generally move first the reported fundamentals follow later. I also read equity research reports of uh, brokers whose quality of content is pretty good. So Ambit, ICSA Securities, Spark Capital, India Infoline, Nirmal Bank, and Axis are some of the brokers whose quality of research is pretty good. I study the annual reports and credit rating reports of companies that I'm tracking. Credit rating reports in general, I feel are very underrated because they often contain a very rich level of detail and extra insight about uh, the companies that you want to study. So you'll often get details about the upcoming CAPEX plans, also the strengths and weaknesses of the business. Uh, so it's a very good source for getting good insight about the business. Draft red herring prospectuses, qualified institutional placement offering documents are a great source for getting rich detail about the underlying industry of a particular company. So as an example, not a stock recommendation, if you want to understand the dynamics of the music licensing industry in India in detail, you can go through the recent QIP offering document of a company named Sarigama Limited. Investor letters of fund man uh, written by fund managers who you ad admire and respect for their philosophy is another good source for idea generation. I like to read letters written by Solid Solidarity, Sage One, Equirus, even 2.2 uh, point capital is good. Investing conclaves, I, attend, I try to look at videos of uh, Tamil Nadu Investor Association and India Investing Conclaves. And for webinar school of interest in compounding or SYC webinars are a very good source for uh, getting good industry and company level knowledge. And less talked about, but very useful resource for generating ideas is fund managers top five holdings from PMS Bazaar website. The sign in on the website is free. And once you log in, you can actually look at the top five holdings along with the allocations for the fund managers whose philosophy you admire and respect. Pulse deals, block deals and insider bank data is tracked on a daily basis. Stockage app does a very good job at this. I also reviewed the 52 week high volume list because if any stock's trading volume hits a 52 week high on a particular day, it generally coincides with something important taking place in that company or its underlying industry. It may not be necessarily so, but it's a good starting point for research. The whole idea is how do you generate ideas, right? So try to tap as many sources as possible. As Peter Lynch said, said the person that turns over the most rocks wins the game. You just need, you just need to be extremely passionate about investing and the mental process of investing and stock research and success is then just a matter of time for magazines i read forbes india fortune india and, and outlook business and for newspapers i read uh, the wall street journal uh, and uh, the economic times in india for industry specific websites for commodities i look at plats.com for chemical i look at chemical weekly for steel i look at for steel i look at steel mint i also engage in uh, daily discussions with my peers and colleagues in the stock market and I'm also on the lookout for the views of the leading analysts of individual sectors. 
finally we have social media forums like twitter whatsapp groups and telegram channels and online forums like value picker and multipy now i ask all of you this one simple question that for the remaining part of your investing career if you go through such an extensive list of resources resources every single day how can you not be simply flooded with opportunities all the time be it a bull market or a bear market or a sideways market in life business relationships or investing nothing will work unless you do and there is no reason for you to settle for an inferior track record in a marketplace like india which is filled with companies having outstanding fundamentals this is one of the most important slides in today's presentation and it is something which i'll refer to back again and again which is that the key attribute of all the greatest investors in history is a is a re relentless focus on the underlying process this is because investing at the end of the day is a probabilistic activity investing is a field in which you are just trying to get the odds on your side as much as possible that is the best you can do just two things your research process and your personal behavior that's it these are the only two things that we as investors can actually control there's nothing else so i'll give you an example here so when i began my small case uh, uh, portfolio uh, activity around 8 months ago then in the beginning even though i tried to follow a very good process i constructed a, i constructed a portfolio of 30 stocks but then within a few months of starting the small case i got to know that you know there were some certain issues which cropped up which was not in my uh, estimates or uh, calculations plus i also realized that in a few companies i've actually gone wrong on certain fundamentals of the business as well so i immediately course corrected and took action and basically removed those uh, weaker stocks and just retained the stronger stocks but what i also realized during that time is that people are very reluctant especially the retail investors are very re reluctant to take losses they are happy with lower returns but they don't want to take losses even if the stock stock is actually bad so it's better to actually construct a more solid portfolio and be and, and do a pre mortem and do a much more thorough analysis of the various tail risks in uh, investments when you are actually managing public money so that's a very good learning which i have taken from my small case and inculcated that into my india fund as well so that was a very good learning for me that when you are managing a personal managing a fund or a, a small case is very different from managing a personal portfolio when you are managing a, a public a fund or a public portfolio then quality and liquidity both are of essence so these are the softer uh, points which you get to learn over time with experience as you manage public money but still investing at the end of the day is a probabilistic activity i've talked about this in my book as well that numerous research studies have identified a common trait among successful professionals in fields of probabilistic activity they all emphasize process over outcome if you focus only on the outcome you are less likely to achieve it instead if you focus on adhering to a sound process the outcome will take care of itself in the long term although the short term results almost always will be driven by luck over the long run a sound process can be counted on to deliver desirable results in a sustained manner and produce more reliable outcomes and michael morbison has spent some gems on this topic in the past as well that in a probabilistic environment you are better served by focusing on the process by which you make a decision than on the outcome you have no control over outcomes but we can control the process and by focusing our attention on process we maximize our chances of good outcomes this is what all good investors think about all the time they think in terms of risk reward that's it i follow a multi pronged approach for idea generation i look for leaders in niche sectors with low competition because like i said competition acts as friction for value creation and what matters in investing is not how fast a particular industry is going to grow what matters is are you able to identify consolidated consolidated profit pools within the value chain of that particular industry in which the company operates that you want to look for supply side dominance or companies having dominant market share so the, the and you ideally want weak competition or the number 2 player should be a distant number 2 or ideally there should not be any number 2 to, to speak about at all so that is the ideal scenario which you want to actually look for i also look for uh, companies having healthy balance sheets high returns on capital employed good revenue growth attract investment activities of private equity funds hedge funds and mutual funds whom i admire and respect and uh, for industry developments i look at sectors undergoing supply side consolidation so a good example is the indian real estate industry in which hundreds and thousands of small developers have folded up in the last decade and the organized sector has gained market share 
regulatory changes are very important to track in a country like india especially because every five years we have a general election and the uh, markets tend to differentiate between the b2g Com companies and the B2C companies and the B2B companies in the months just leading up to the general election. So you'll often notice for the first four years, you know, even the B2G companies may do well. But as soon as you get you enter the fourth year and leading up to the fifth year, when the general election is going to take place, that is when you'll notice that uh, the markets tend to derate all those government linked businesses. So it's if you want to sleep better at night, it's better to avoid B2G and government linked companies, even though the valuation is very attractive. But at this stage of my career, I'm focusing more on stress adjusted returns than absolute returns. So I would just want to sleep peacefully at night and I want to ensure the same for my clients as well. I also track emerging sectoral adoption trends. So a good example here is how we consume music. So in the past, we used to consume music through audio cassettes and CDs, but today we consume music through the use of streaming applications and digital service providers like YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Samon, Ghana, Wink, Spotify, etc. But one of my favorite sources for uh, idea generation is through tracking corporate events, namely change in promoter and management, demergers, block deals, merger arbitrage, and companies completing a significant capex. So let's discuss a few of them, starting with change in promoter and management. So in August 2020, the stock of CG Power was was a penny stock trading for sub 10 rupees. And in 2019, the company had been hit, hit with a 3,000 crore rupee fraud. And the stock markets are ruthless when it comes to bad levels of corporate governance. The stock markets can tolerate slower growth, lower margins, but they will not tolerate bad corporate governance. Enter the Murugupa Group from South India, which is known for its stellar track record of execution and high standards of corporate governance. They announced the acquisition of CG Power in August 2020. And since then, the stock of CG Power has given more than 1500% returns already. And this is what happens again and again in the stock market that when you have a good asset, good underlying asset, which is mismanaged or being managed by a promoter with bad corporate governance, once that company is taken over by another promoter or management co uh, led company with very high standards of corporate governance and proven track record, proven track record of execution, you get a recipe for multi baggers. And this is why promoter management change is such a powerful tool in an intelligent investor's arsenal, especially in a marketplace like India, because here there the re-rating takes place very, very fast in such cases. So be on the lookout for such cases. And there are many such similar opportunities like CG Power available in the market today, in which there has been a promoter management change. The next source for ID generation is that of a block deal. So sometimes in the stock market, you'll notice that there are two things. So sometimes you'll notice just this, that even after a good earnings report and good management commentary, the stock price has actually fallen. So for people uh, who, who track a stock called Sinjin Limited, you would, have, you would have seen that in Friday straight, it fell 5%. As per the uh, media reports, that's, prob that's because next week there's going to be a block deal on the stock. The earnings, uh, this quarter's earnings were very subdued, nothing great, very average, but the management commentary is very bullish. Still, the stock fell 5% on Friday in a rising market. That was the first tip off that, that a block deal is coming. Second, this was the case. So the Sinjin example is a case where the quarterly results are average and the stock has fallen ahead of a block deal. Now, the next case. Sometimes you'll observe that even after a blockbuster quarterly earnings report, the stock price is falling. And many investors are perplexed as to how is this even possible. It may so happen that there's an institutional shareholder who's looking to exit that stock because of any short-term technical reason. For example, a new fund manager may have taken over the fund or the fund may be facing redemption pressure or the fund's investment mandate may have changed. Whatever be the technical reason, as investors, we are only focused on the intrinsic value of the business. And whenever someone sells in desperation, they tend to sell cheap. And as a buyer, I love to be on the opposite side of such trades in which the other party is being forced to liquidate holdings at any price regardless of underlying value. And this is a special situation. Last year on July, June 15th, it was reported that Global, uh, uh, the Templeton Strategic Emerging Markets Fund had sold 2.36 lakh shares of Global Spirits in a bulk deal. And as soon as the selling pressure from this fund got absorbed by the market, the stock of Global Spirits went on to give more than 300% returns over the next six months before paring back a large part of the gains in the last in the recent bear market. 
the next source of id generation is that of merger arbitrage so in my book uh, i've dedicated an entire chapter to special situations with a focus on spin offs and demergers but in that chapter i've mentioned how benjamin graham used to write a series of articles for the analyst journal and in 1946 he wrote in the broader sense a special situation is one in which a particular development is counted upon to yield a satisfactory profit in the security even though the general market does not advance this is the best part about special situations that they are generally market, stock market agnostic or market movement agnostic even in a bear market or and the the best virtues and the uh, special abilities of the special situations is best appreciated during a bear market or a range bound or sideways market because these kind of this kind of investing tends to stand out in such kind of uh, market conditions in the narrow sense you do not have a real special situation unless the particular development is already underway this is important the official announcement the official corporate announcement already has to have taken place in order for you to call it a special situation it's not based on speculation or hearsay or anticipation the official notification comes out and then the special situation starts so let's look at an example from last year in january 2021 in which on that as of that day uh, Minda Industries had announced the merger of Haitha Seating with itself at a 1.5 to 1 merger ratio, and observe what was happening then. The stock price of Minda Industries was 508, which meant that based on the merger ratio of 1.5 to 1, as a shareholder of Haitha Seating, you would get shares worth 508 multiplied by 1.52 equal to 772. But what was the stock price of Haitha Seating that day? 534, which meant that you could have made more than 40% returns in just a few months. if you were able to spot this inefficiency in the market next month minda industries reported a great set of numbers and for every 10% up move in minda industry stock as an investor in haitha seating you would enjoy 15.2% capital appreciation because of the merger ratio the next day the merger step the merger came one step closer to completion and finally on 9th april last year the stock of haitha seating was delisted from the stock exchanges at a price of 766 per share And what was the price just a few months ago? 534. And similar uh, merger arbitrage opportunities even exist in the market today. You just have to uh, look for them. You will always take one of these four risks when you buy a stock: business risk, management risk, valuation risk, industry risk. And there are only four things that can happen in investing: a big profit, a big loss, a small profit, or a small loss. and if you can eliminate the big losses you shall do very well and how do i go about ensuring that i try avoid the big losses it is by avoiding certain things as an investor namely investing in commodity and cyclical businesses near the peak of their cycle at peak operating margins investing in government owned companies because the promoter scheme motivation is not wealth creation for shareholders it is it is to do societal good investing in project based businesses dealing with government tenders because in these businesses the cash flow risk is real debtors days and receivable days is very high and cash flow conversion is generally pretty poor investing in melting ice cubes or what i call value traps because many stocks in india look optically cheap but they cheap for a reason a good example is the print newspaper stocks in india because we consume news digitally now so the underlying earnings are in decline so they keep getting more expensive over time time is the friend of the good business and the enemy of the bad business so avoid the bad businesses or the value traps also avoid venturing outside your circle of competence driven by the lure of quick short term returns in bull markets this is a common mistake which most amateur new uh, newcomer investors make in the market i did it i also used to do this as well in the initial years of my investing journey but over time you just get to realize that it's not all the stress is just not worth it it's better to be to do invest in good businesses and let the management do the heavy lifting for you there's no better feeling than that to see your net worth and capital grow over time as the management executes and the business generates profits cash flows and dividends one common question which i get asked often is how am i able to evaluate management quality of companies in india while living and working in the us and i am able to do that through use of a cop- comprehensive corporate governance checklist i look for any frequent change in auditors any qualifications raised by auditors are the auditors having abnormal fees is the auditor fees growing faster than the revenue does the company have a long list of unaudited foreign subsidiaries 
Does the promoter have any political affiliations or criminal proceedings against him? Has the company been subjected to CBI enforcement directed or income tax rates in the past? Or any cases of SEBI debarment from the capital markets? What is the history of churn and attrition in the C-suite? Is the key management personnel drawing excessive remuneration or blowing large sums on building a lavish corporate office? Is the, the company diluted, diluting its equity? Is the promoter holding coming down? Is the promoter pledging his shares? Has the company shared wealth with uh, dividends? And, uh, has the company shared wealth with uh, minority shareholders in the form of dividends, dividends and share buybacks? Has the company taken any loan from the promoter at an above market interest rate? Are the related party transactions significant in size? What is the view of the current and ex employees of the company? You can get this information on Glassdoor.com. What are the views of industry experts and reputed investors about the company? Is the promoter running a similar business as the, as the listed entity in his privately held company because that may lead to a conflict of interest? Also evaluate accounting quality. So as an example, check for volatility and depreciation rate because the depreciation rate or the policy can be modified by the management to manipulate earnings. Also check if any expenses has been directly, writ has been directly writ written off from the reserves and surpluses on the balance sheet instead of being routed through the profit and loss account or the income statement thus ending profit check whether the business is working capital intensive is the more importantly is the accounts receivable or inventory is going up because that indicates that more uh, cash is getting stuck up in receivables and inventory check for the trends in the cash flow from operations to net income ratio because this ratio tells you how much of the net reported net income is getting converted into cash from operations to fund your investing and financing activities also check for any abnormally high margins versus peers in a commodity industry because it's very unusual for a commodity company to be earning 30 percent plus margins while its peers are having 10 percent margins so in such cases do a deeper dive to see what's happening check for any excessive write-offs of assets in the past because some companies what they do is they engage in what is known as gold plating of capex so they may over invoice the cost of the plant and machinery and then the promoter may siphon off the difference into his personal account. Check for any capitalization of regular operating expense. So a good example here is the Indian pharmaceutical industry in which research and development R&D is a very common line expense item. In uh, case of some companies, they expense out the entire R&D in the very year in which it is incurred. That's conservative good accounting. But some aggressive managements, they capitalize the R&D to smoothen out earnings. So you have to learn to differentiate between an aggressive accounting and a conservative accounting. Generally, I tend to prefer conservative, conservative accounting practice any day. Also check for trends in the debt to equity ratio, any uh, defaults on statutory payments. Does the company have any high contingent liabilities or any off balance sheet obligations? Off balance sheet obligations, a good example is, good example here is, has the company guaranteed the, the debt of its group companies through the listed entity? So check for all this in the annual report and some of you may, may well ask what do they need to do so much hard work who looks at balance sheet and cash flow in a bull market let alone footnotes to the accounts i simply respond by telling those people that when you, you're in a position of fiduciary responsibility of managing other people's hard and savings then you owe it to them to reciprocate the trust in you now it may so well happen that even after doing all this work you may still go wrong or miss something miss something but at least you'll have the satisfaction and the contentment that at least you you tried to your you tried your best to a good do a good job, and that this is where checklists are so so valuable and helpful as an investor because we tend to think that we can recall everything that we need to check from memory, but we tend to skip or miss out on many vital elements. So have a structured checklist in place and follow. Just try to uh, tick off all the items from the list. The next thing which I strive to avoid as an investor is taking a short-term view because investing is a long-term game. The more time you give it, the higher the odds of success. And over the long run, it's sales and profits which drive stock price returns. So in the short term, in a period of less than one year, as you can see on this chart, almost, ha almost half of a stock price movement is explained by public sentiment change or changes in the valuation multiple. But over the long run of 10 years and more, almost 90% of a stock price movement is explained by revenues and profits. In the short term, the market is a voting machine. But in the long run, the stock market is a weighing machine which weighs revenues and profits. 
a great book on valuation which is titled the valuation measuring and managing the value of companies in that the authors write and i quote we have found empirically that long term revenue growth particularly organic revenue growth is the most important driver of shareholder returns for companies with high returns on capital if any company is having to go for a big bang acquisition you can be rest assured that that business has basically exhausted its growth opportunities growth potential that's why it's looking to go for those big bang so called transformative mna or transformative acquisitions be very wary in those cases because the base rates of success for large acquisitions is generally very low bolt on acquisitions or strategic small acquisitions are on the other hand are much more preferable because generally the base rates base rates of success in those situations is much higher traditionally there have been three sources of edge for the individual investor the first edge was the information edge but with the advent of the internet and widespread dissemination of information the information edge is basically gone the second source of edge traditionally for the investor has been the analytical edge but with more and more smart people entering the investing profession even the analytical edge is fast getting compressed but the one edge which is the most sustainable and durable in my view is that of behavior and temperament shane parish of farnham street blog writes in a quote people who arbitrage time will almost always outperform the first order thought of instant gratification is a crowded path ensuring mediocre results at best delayed gratification which requires second order thinking is less crowded and more likely to get results howard marx has very aptly said that rule number 1 most things will prove to be cyclical and rule number 2 some of the greatest opportunities for gain and loss come when other people forget rule number 1 50 years ago the best investors were the ones with an informational edge but today the best investors are the ones with a behavioral edge today an investor's edge is less about knowing more than others about a specific stock and more about the mindset discipline and willingness to take a long term view about the intrinsic value of a business and i've talked about the same in my book chapter on delayed gratification and i quote from the chapter investors generally overlook businesses that are doing things that will create significant incremental earnings one or two years from now because they don't want to wait that far out and investors often shun businesses that are investing for the future and currently are suffering from low initial margins in those new initiatives even if they are expected to experience an exponential jump in earnings growth after that the stock markets generally do not initially increase the market value of these businesses but they do re-rate them however around the time when the earnings growth is clearly visible so as an example here there are a few mid cap companies in india some consumer facing mid cap companies which are and there are some, some good b2b companies as well which are just about to complete a significant size capex towards the end of september but the revenues and profits from that capex will start reflecting from uh, properly from january onwards so during this quarter q1 results and during q2 results the impact of those of that capex may not be fully visible so the stock prices may not move that much but as soon as the revenues and profits from the new capex starts reflecting next year the stock market will immediately re-rate those businesses so right now as an investor is the time to buy those businesses at a cheaper valuation rather than buying them after the market has already recognized them next next year and the reported earnings come out and then you would have to buy them at a much more higher price so the key in these cases is patience just check for business management quality and if those two things are in place then you just need to buy these stocks when the effect of the capex is still not reflected as of yet in the numbers that is how you get an edge over competition and as investors we get an edge over competition if we pick these companies and have the patience and conviction to hold them and although these businesses are clearly undervalued on a longer term basis it is psychologically challenging and to invest in them and even more so to hold on to them and these difficulties result in a lack of investors and the subsequent mispricing of these stocks because the price discovery is weak when the investors attention on these stocks is low so as an example uh, in 2018 and in 2019 the indian auto industry was in a down cycle was the nbfc crisis and there was an auto ancillary company named rajratan global buyer which was undertaking a very big tax now because the entire auto sector was out of favor investors attention on this particular stock was not there so you could accumulate as much quantity as you wanted as much stock as you wanted during the period of neglect and as soon as the earnings visibility among investors went up post the ex- completion of the capex and a slight initial recovery in the auto cycle the stock of rajratan global has given more than 1200% returns in the last two years 
and this is deep value investing at its finest you want to invest in such capex plays during a down cycle and then patiently hold on to them through the future industry up cycle to deep maximum capital appreciation the only thing you need to check in these cases is when you invest in such uh, capex plays during the down cycle is that whether the balance sheet is strong enough to handle another one to two years of a industry, continued industry downturn because you, the last thing you want is for the company to complete the capex take on a lot, take on a lot of debt but then blow up because the down because the balance sheet is just not strong enough so ideally look for companies which have completed this capex from internal accruals and have a good balance sheet now successful investing is all about pattern recognition so much so that i've dedicated, dedicated an entire chapter in my book to pattern recognition in which i write and i quote along with the slow and gradual macro changes investors should also be alert to tiny changes at the macro level be alert to tiny changes like the declaration of a maiden dividend receipt of a large order or a landmark contract appointment of a big four auditor increased or first time disclosures or disclosure or discussion about business prospects and future plans in annual reports presentations or press releases a chairman or a ceo of a listed company sharing business commentary for the very first time a company holding an analyst or investor conference call for the very first time or after a very long time or notable improvements or deteriorations in the working capital cycle always monitor the direction of the quality warnings and such an elaborate and exhaustive exercise requires total dedication on part of the on part of the investor but it is highly highly rewarding how is it highly rewarding i'll explain through three case studies starting with always monitor the direction of the quality warnings so investing is always about delta or the rate of change in earnings growth and the underlying quality of the growth so this is a snippet from the annual report of a company in india it's a very old company more than a century old started operations in 1919 and from 1919 to 2005 it was in the fertilizer business from 2005 to 2011 they shut down the fertilizer business and started manufacturing low margin bulk chemicals and from 2011 onwards they started focusing on high margin specialty chemicals so this is why warren buffett says the business should be viewed as an unfolding movie not as a still photograph so as you can see in this company's case also the direction of the quality of earnings growth is improving with time and last year on 10 february this company came out with a detailed presentation on the bombay stock exchange website de detailing their capex plans and as soon as the earnings visibility among investors about the earnings growth and the quality of this business improving over time once that recognition took place so since uh, february last year the stock of ramsi moraji chemicals has given more than 40% returns the second case study or the second pattern for today increased or first time disclosures or discussion about business prospects and future plans in annual reports presentations or press releases so recall this slide from earlier in the presentation where i talked about how you need to work hard today to let good luck find you in the future and how i review all the corporate announcements on the bombay stock exchange website including investor presentations so on the right hand side of the slide you can see a snippet or a portion of the investor presentation of a company in india this uh, investor presentation was released for the very first time by this company in its listed history on 1st november um, that is around 8 months ago and notice something very interesting here the company has announced 96 crores capex at 3x asset turns which means 300 crores of incremental additional revenue is going to come and this plant will start operations from second quarter of this year and the trailing 12 month revenues of this business is just 100 crores which meant that this company was going to quadruple its revenues in the next 2 years and ever since the re release of this investor presentation 8 months ago the stock of natural capsules has given more than 130% returns in the last 8 months even during a small cap bear market the third and final pattern for today a landmark contract so in february 2020 navin fluorine in india won a 7 year 2900 crore contract in its high performance product segment and since february 2020 the stock of navin fluorine has given 140% returns and observe something very interesting here so out of that uh, 140% returns 90% came from p re rating or valuation re rating the p ratio almost doubled and as investors we need to ask ourselves why did this happen 
why did the p ratio of navin flurin or the valuation multiple given to this business almost double after winning that long term contract and to understand that you need to understand what i call the art of valuation to be a successful investor you don't need to do a precise dcf calculation on a spreadsheet you just need to have a dcf mindset focusing on drivers of terminal value because all intelligent investing is all about terminal value that is where the maximum value of a business resides the terminal value and if you can understand what drives terminal value you'll understand what drives multiple re rating and multiple d rating so charlie munger has said be a business analyst not a securities analyst let's go back to the first principles of investing intelligent investing is all about understanding intrinsic value this is the one of the chapters in my book and i quote from the chapter the intrinsic value of an asset is the sum of the cash flows expected to be received from that asset over its remaining useful life discounted for the time value of money and the uncertainty of receiving those cash flows predictability of cash flows is an important factor and less predictable cash flows need to be discounted at a higher rate now i'm about to share the holy grail of valuation with all of you and if you can imbibe what i'm about to say now you you shall have an edge over most of your investing competition it is the perception among investors regarding the riskiness of the cash flows of a business which in turn drives the discount rate which they use to value the business and that in turn drives the valuation multiple given to a business and again repeat it is the perception among investors regarding the riskiness of the cash flows of a business which in turn drives the discount rate which those investors use to value the business and that in turn determines the valuation multiple given to the business this is because the market places a heavy weight on certainty and stocks with the promise of years of predictable earnings growth tend to go into a long period of overvaluation until such time that they are no longer able to grow earnings in a steady manner so you look at stocks again not a stock recommendation just examples look at stocks like navin fluorine look at stocks like vedan fashions but right? even if they grow earnings at a slower pace because the predictability in the longevity of growth is so high those stocks tend to remain in an over, overvalued or an expensive uh, valuation zone for a long period of time because predictability of long term growth matters much more to the stock market than the absolute rate of near term growth so a stock like a cyclical stock for example that promises to grow earnings at 50% for the next 2 3 years with no glad clarity thereafter it is given a lower valuation multiple by the market than a stock that has got slower but highly predictable growth for a much longer period consistent growth increases valuation consistent disruption decreases valuation and the longevity of growth is always given a greater weight by the market than the absolute rate of growth so you'll often notice stocks with 12 to 15 15% predictable earnings growth for the next 10 to 15 years getting current year pe multiples of 40 to 50, 50 times and sometimes even higher during a low interest rate environment and this phenomena perplexes most new, new investors but with experience they come to appreciate the finer nuances of the market and respect its wisdom the expensive high quality secular growth stocks tend to remain at elevated valuations for extended periods of time because investors in such stocks generally are willing to sit out periods of high valuation until earnings catch up catches up and markets provide disproportionate rewards to companies that can provide years of sustainable earnings growth so if you are able to identify such a business in its infancy in a small cap stage when the valuation is still reasonable you have found a potential multi bagger now why does this pre- longevity premium get accorded to such companies it's because longevity of growth is becoming increasingly scarce in today's world which is characterized by rapid pace of change fewer than 12% of the fortune 500 companies in 1955 were still on the list 62 years later in 2017 and 88% of those fortune 500 companies had either gone bankrupt or had merged with or were acquired by another firm and if they still exist they have fallen from the top 5 uh, fortune 500 companies list and this is joseph's computer's creative destruction at its very best the key takeaway here is that companies with high longevity high duration of cash flows by definition tend to have higher intrinsic value now if there is one big thing that has benefited me immensely in my investing trading and wealth creation journey over the years it is this listening very attentively to and learning from my peers seniors and juniors who are much more smarter and hard working than me one should always be humble and the more you reach out to and associate with individuals who are better and smarter than you are the more you will learn and the faster you will improve 
and the great thing about today's digital age is that there are so many bright and hard working investors and traders on twitter whatsapp groups and telegram channels and all i need to do is listen attentively to what they are sharing and then sincerely do the required study at my end there has never been a better time to be a humble and grounded person ralph waldo emerson said every man i meet is my master in some point and in that i learn of him learning and accepting help from others creates value far beyond our individual capabilities so look at every interaction as an opportunity to learn from the people you meet you will be amazed at how quickly you grow and how much better you become both as a professional and more important as a human being so keep learning from everyone on uh, 4th august 2020 i tweeted about how i had learned investing in uh, spin offs and de mergers from my junior colleague somya malani and i had applied that learning from him to a stock named rd surfactants on 4th august 2020 and since august 4th 2020 the stock of arkis surfactant subsequently gave more than 600% returns before pairing back gains in the recent bear market having learned how to invest in demergers and spin offs from my colleague i applied that very same learning again last year to a stock named jublin and gravia on 29 march and the stock of jublin and gravia ended up giving more than 200% returns in the next 6 months from that date before pairing back a large part of the gains in the recent uh, bear market now you may uh, some people may at this point may ask you know how do we preserve a large chunk of the profits in such cases where the gains are so front loaded and so fast there's a very good way uh, to actually uh, there's a good uh, mechanism or a way to preserve a large chunk of the gains so mark minervini a very reputed trader has written two excellent books on uh, trading and investing based based on technicals and fundamentals a combination of technicals and fundamentals and in his second book is actually given a lot of good ways in how you can manage risk and preserve a large portion of your gains through the use of trailing stop losses or break of a moving average like the 21 day moving average or the 50 day moving average or the 200 day moving average whatever method you choose the key is to be disciplined and to be consistent that is the, that is the key thing there are multiple ways to uh, uh, preserve a large part of the gains but just be consistent with whatever process you follow that's the key So what is the big insight that we get from all this today? It is that all intelligent investing is value investing. And if I had not self-educated myself on different areas of value in the market, then I would have never been able to participate in broad-based bull markets. And my personal investment opportunity set has significantly expanded over the years with time and experience in the markets. Initially, I started off by reading reading Benjamin Graham. So I invested in low price to earnings, low price to book stocks. Then I then I learned about quality from Buffett, Munger, and Phil Fisher. and i started investing in quality at reasonable prices but today it covers multiple areas of the investment universe including commodities cyclicals deep value spin offs reverse merger promoter management change etc and instead of being restricted by my personal biased views to a small opportunity set as was the case during my early years i am now able to invest in a variety of industries and situations wherever i find mispricing of value and a highly favorable risk and return trade off you see no single strategy works all of the time and in every kind of market and that is why it is essential to build up one's investing arsenal to be able to hunt for value from within different areas and over the years i come to realize and appreciate just why this is so critically important it is because a bull market is always going on at all points of time in some specific sectors of the indian stock market between 96 to 2000 it was in technology media and communications between 2003 to 2008 it was in infrastructure commodities real estate and organized retail between 2009 and 2014 it was in discretionary consumption pharmaceuticals it services fmcg between 2015 and 2018 it was in autos specialty chemicals nbfcs macrofinance companies and since early 2020 uh, the new bull run has, new bull run has started in various sub segments within india's manufacturing industry with a particular emphasis on import substitution building materials housing finance companies ethanol blending cloud computing electric vehicles multiple new trends have started and it is my personal conviction and belief that the opportunities in the next 20 years in india will be far greater than the, than those in the past 20 years and the opportunities of the last 20 years will be dwarfed by the opportunities of the next 20 years and where will these opportunities come from they'll come from two sources variant perception and long term structural trends variant perception refers to having a differentiated view on the short to medium term trajectory of a business and it refers to and a variant perception refers to situations where you get earnings growth 
coupled with return on a capital employed ROC expansion and valuation re valuation re rating, and you end up with multi baggers. So it's a, th it's a three pronged in engine: earnings growth, ROC expansion, valuation re rating. That's how you get the multi baggers. And there are multiple triggers for variant perception, including a product mix change into a higher margin category. So there is a pigment player in India, which is which is She's just about to get over with its capex in which a large part of the new capex is towards higher margin specialty pigment so the margin profile may actually improve good from here on for that particular company operating leverage is another good source for variant perception especially for companies which have either completed a, completed a very big capex or are sitting on very high levels of unutilized capacity just at the start of an industry up cycle industry cycle shift is another good source so as an example the indian residential real estate uh, sector turned around after more than a decade in mid 2020 and we have already had multiple multi baggers from the building building material space in the last two years regulatory change at the very good source so in early 2020 the government of india placed a very heavy heavy emphasis on ethanol blending and you've had so many multi baggers coming in the last two years from sugar mills and distill distilleries deleveraging is a good source because as debt goes down interest cost goes down net profit goes up market cap goes up Improvement in asset turns is another good source. You can get this information on conference calls from the management. You can ask them what is the expected turnover on the new fixed asset capacity. Now, there are two sources for ROC expansion, margin improvement and improvement in asset turns. And between the two, I prefer the latter because high margins tend to attract competition. Corporate actions like demergers, merger arbitrage, promoter management change, we've discussed these. Divestiture of a loss making or a non-core business is another source. As you sell a loss making business, the net profit goes up, market cap goes up. And as you sell off a non core business, the markets reward you with a higher valuation multiple because the stock markets like focus management and focus businesses. Long term structural trends are found in businesses with, which are operating in industries having a very favorable structure. They're experiencing some form of an industry tailwind. They're characterized by consistency and predictability of cash flows. They have a long runway for growth ahead. So you have high visibility for many years ahead. They're also characterized by value migration. So in India, for the last decade, we have had value migration from public to private, offline to online, unorganized to organized. And there are multiple structural growth plays in India today. Contract development and manufacturing organizations, contract research and manufacturing services, custom synthesis and manufacturing, because low cost manufacturing is in India's DNA. Specialty chemicals with critical application, affordable housing, FinTech, music streaming, financialization of savings, digital transformation, cloud computing, you have multiple mega trends in the Indian stock market and Stellar Wealth FlexiCap Small Case and Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund is a blend of variant perception and long-term structural trends. It's a, uh, it's, a bench, it's a benchmark agnostic portfolio of uh, 20 to 30 stocks. And the mathematical rationale for that is that that is the optimal number of holdings to maximize the risk and return trade-off. As part of the study published in the international bestseller, uh, a random walk on Wall Street, it was demonstrated that as the number of stocks in a portfolio reaches 25 to 30 names, the incremental volatility reducing benefits of diversification reach near zero. And this is the sweet spot for an active investor seeking to outperform the market. At 25 to 30 stocks, you have captured almost all of the benefits of diversification, yet the number of companies you need to know thoroughly is still manageable. I'll now briefly talk about how value investing, in my view, resembles a life discipline. Now, investing is a field of competitive learning and in order to outperform the rest, you have to outlearn the rest. And Michael Morbison has authored a brilliant paper in August 2016 titled 30 Years, Reflection on the 10 Attributes of Great Investors. And in, in one of my past interviews on Stock and Ladder blog, I had outlined those 10 attributes along with my favorite books on each of those 10 attributes. So I'll just outline a few, I'll just outline those attributes for all of you today. Be numerate and understand accounting, understand value, properly assess strategy, compare effectively, think probabilistically, update your views effectively, beware of behavioral biases, know the difference between information and influence, position sizing and reading. And I'd, and I'd also added three more attributes to that list. Extreme levels of patience coupled with the ability to act decisively when the no-brainer opportunities present themselves, multidisciplinary thinking and inversion. Benjamin Graham Franklin has very rightly said that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And Warren Buffett conquers. The more you learn, the more you'll earn. The best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. 
and the value investing discipline has certain finite aspects that we come to realize and appreciate only with the passage of time and with experience with the passage of time we learn to recognize that value investing is not merely about stocks and business fundamentals it is a life discipline and i've talked about the same in my books chapter on overrated and underrated behaviors and i'll share a few of them with all of you knowledge is overrated wisdom is underrated intellect is overrated temperament is underrated outcome is overrated process is underrated forecasting is overrated preparation is underrated confidence is overrated humility is underrated conviction is overrated pragmatism is underrated complexity is overrated simplicity is underrated analytical ability is overrated personal behavior is underrated having a high income level is overrated inculcating a disciplined savings habit is underrated competition with peers is overrated helping them is underrated large personal net worth is overrated good karma is underrated talent is overrated resilience is underrated being the best investor is overrated being the most authentic version of yourself is underrated i'll conclude the uh, talk with two key messages from my book that the goals of investment should be happiness joy growth intellectual satisfaction and eventually peace and serenity wealth and financial prosperity are natural by products of lifelong learning and many people achieve success but to sustain the same and potentially build on it over an entire lifetime requires humility gratitude and a constant learning mindset for any feedback or queries feel free to connect with me on stellarwealthpartners.com i can also be reached on linkedin and twitter you can learn more about my book the joys of compounding at the joys of compounding.com and readers can get their copy of the book on amazon google play books and book depository website with that i come to the end of my presentation thank you saket thanks gautam uh, i think it was a lovely presentation how you summed up your entire framework and then went through various aspects of you know what are the tools for idea creation and then how do you monitor them etc uh you know i i really liked how you talked about the fact that and this is i think uh, even you know when we had met uh, we had a brief interaction when you were here in calcutta we were talking about how it's really important to see a whether there is real terminal value in the earnings growth uh, of a, of a company right so it can be through a mix of structural factors or whether there's a management change and a lot of time the industry just goes through a change so irrespective of you know whatever companies you pick up there could be a high chance that the probability of you making an error reduces in fact uh, even that slide that you mentioned right where uh, the optimum number of stocks that you need in a portfolio the math where you reduce the volatility uh, i read this in the book uh, i think coffee can investing saurav and uh, the other authors had done this exercise where they said that the moment you increase the portfolio of your stocks from 1 to 2 right uh, you basically i mean end up reducing or reducing the risk by almost 80% and as that keeps on increasing the uh, the the risk of volatility keeps coming down so that's true, uh, that's true. Yep. yeah i mean we'll open it up for a few questions i think we have another 5 to 6 minutes and then uh, you know we can close this stream uh, i think most of the things that you said were quite self explanatory so you know i hardly doubt whether we'll have any questions but uh, let's see uh, we'll keep it open uh, also this uh, mention of credit rating reports right even i a lot of times especially for companies where you don't find a lot of stuff in the institutional coverage universe or in the annual reports they always give you a treasure trove of information uh, so that also is a interesting uh, report or a document that investors can track i think that uh, gives them a good framework to look at very much so i'll give you a live example so just yesterday night i was going through the most recent credit credit rating report of a company which i was planning to include in my india fund but this company was basically claiming that they are doing crams for patented uh, products but actually when you go through the credit report you actually get to know that they are actually doing it for off patent products and basically it's all generic there's no 
high margin patent element at all so it was an eye opener for me also i got to appreciate the working capital intensity of that particular business after after reading this particular credit report then i went back to reading the previous few conference call transcripts and i got to know that two quarters ago the management on the conference call when they were asked how, how come your operating cash flow is negative the management said that we would we would rather prioritize profits over cash and cash flow that was such a big red flag for me that i immediately <laughs> deleted that stock from my watch list immediately so this is how as an investor the dots basically get connected you start off reading something well expecting something and then you go to, then you go down the rabbit rabbit hole and you get to know so many different negative facets of a business which just escape your mind earlier great uh, sandeep has a question uh, he talks about the fact that a lot of times we make the mistake of late entry or early exit due to lack of knowledge of right valuation <laughs> so is there any book or tool uh, for valuation yes there are, i'll share three resources here first is a book called valuation measuring and managing the value of companies which i referred to in my talk and then i would refer the two white papers which i have shared about in my book as well the first white paper is titled what does a price to earning multiple mean by michael morbison and uh, the second white paper is the p ratio a user's manual by epoch investment partners just google for these two white papers on the internet you'll get it okay so those are the two white papers that one can uh, refer to uh, there are a few questions with respect to whether the you know there are any ideas that you're currently studying uh, uh, or you know what uh, exactly is i mean you've told us the process i don't think whether you're at the liberty to discuss uh, the names i would just but... i would simply tell them to re- refer to regulation so i'll tell you so i'll tell you few good resources where you can get those special situations which i'm studying subscribe to neil bell's newsletter he discusses a lot of special situations there then uh, this is uh, social media handled by tar uh, tar basically has a website i think called invest karo india in which he has created 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 a dashboard of special situations that's another very good resource and uh, apart from this also you can look at regulation 30 newsletter which actually captures these special situations in detail whenever they arise so these three resources are very useful great uh any books you would uh, recommend for someone to learn the basics of accounting to decode balance sheets yes so uh, there is a book called romancing the balance sheet by dr lamba it's a, he's an indian author that's a good introduction to good gentle introduction to understanding how to analyze financial statements all right i mean uh, the obvious questions you know gautam what are your views on the current global economic scenario <laughs> well frankly speaking as far as the indian markets are concerned we are just con- con- primarily concerned with one single macro variable that is oil prices that's it basically that is the day india is able to overcome its limitation of oil manufacturing that day no one can from that day onwards no one can stop india from becoming a truly global superpower so it's my personal view and conviction and india is taking great steps towards that end through a focus on renewable energy and uh, a focus on ethanol blending so the government is fo- going in the right direction as far as reducing our dependency on oil imports is concerned but we do have a long way to go and here i would like to share a very good investing tip for all of you who invest in the indian market some of the greatest opportunities in the indian small cap and mid cap space occur periodically once every decade whenever there is an oil shock or a period of very high inflation so this happened in 2013 when the indian rupee depreciated sharply and there was a sell off in the small cap and mid cap space exact same pattern repeated again this year when the rupee depreciated sharply post the oil price shock and you had a 30% crash in the small cap index with many stocks down 40 50% this is a key macro variable to track if you want to really want to get great prices entry prices when investing in small cap and mid cap stocks in india all right uh sid has a question gautam do you also evaluate stock uh based on uh, technicals when uh, you are evaluating them you did mention about the whole framework on fundamentals but do you also use technical parameters i do uh, so basically mark mermini has talked about a four stage an- st- four stage analysis in his book stage 1 when the stock is in a period of neglect and uh, this trading in a sideways range stage 2 
when the stock breaks out of that trading range on large volumes that indicates that institutions are entering that stock and something important is taking place in that, in that company stage 3 is basically distribution where the stock price does not react to good news and just there's large volumes with flat stock price action that told tells you that distribution is taking place and you, after that you have finally have the the meltdown or the uh, collapse in the stock price that's stage 4 so if you follow a four stage uh, and this is like this for timing your entries into the stock market in individual stocks you just help boost the chances of getting a entry in a stock just when it is about to take off and give you very good gains so read mark minavini's book he combines technicals and fundamentals very well in his book great i think gautam uh, that's it on the questions uh, thanks a lot for taking the time out i think i'll probably have to you know rewatch this session multiple times to go through the plethora of frameworks you've thrown <laughs> today uh, and i'm yet to complete reading your book so uh, maybe that will complement this and both of this can go together in in really uh, taking this through so thanks a lot uh, for tuning in viewers as well uh, with that we'll end this uh, session today uh, and hopefully we'll see you again uh, quite soon thank you everyone have a great day ahead thank you Thank you.